Suzanne Samar, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. Embark on a captivating journey through the enthralling world of forests and learn how trees are connected in intricate, life-giving ways in Suzanne Samard's Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. Through her rich narrative, Samar uncovers the dynamic ties between trees, fungi, and other species to reveal the complex cooperation and communication that occurs beneath our feet. Explore the concept of the Ewood Wide Web and the roles of so-called mother trees in fostering a thriving, interconnected woodland ecosystem. The summary provides an engrossing introduction to the symbiotic networks that populate the underground world of the forest, the implications for modern forestry, and the fascinating personal journey of the author as she unveils the secrets of the forest. The Mycelium Mystery Deep in the misty forest, Suzanne discovers trees with glowing yellow roots and subterranean networks of colorful mycelium. Oddly, the recently reforested clear-cut area holds barely alive seedlings lacking these vibrant fungal connections. Intrigued, she wonders if this seemingly unnatural phenomenon offers a valuable insight into the dying seedlings problem and a potential solution for future reforestation endeavors. Wandering through the fog-enshrouded forest, Suzanne admired the damp firs as they shimmered in the afternoon light. Her journey took her to a clear cut, where new seedlings had been planted as part of her logging company's reforestation efforts. Along the way, she noticed a swillous mushroom, plucking it from the earth to reveal fine yellow mycelium threads beneath the surface. On the way to the clear cut, Suzanne's foot slipped, and she fell, desperately clutching a small tree for balance. The young tree came out of the ground with her and she noticed its roots covered by the same bright yellow mycelium as the mushroom. Digging deeper into the forest floor, she found a colorful network of fungal threads interwoven with the soil. As Suzanne arrived at the clear cut, she observed the stark contrast between the once vibrant, ancient trees and the lifeless seedlings planted in evenly spaced rows. These new trees seemed to struggle for life, and closer examination revealed a distinct lack of the vibrant mycelium on their roots. Despite the well-executed planting process, the seedlings seemed unable to establish a connection with the soil. Intrigued by the disparity, Suzanne spotted a healthy fir that had sprouted on its own. This tree's roots revealed the same bright yellow mycelium she'd discovered earlier. Suzanne found herself pondering the purpose of these threads, unsure if they posed a threat, provided assistance, or had an altogether neutral effect on the tree's growth. As she concluded her assessment, Suzanne realized that the plantation was a failure. The logging company faced a tough decision, risk replanting the seedlings using the same methods and hope for a better outcome or find a new solution altogether. Knowing that the same approach might end in disappointment, Suzanne couldn't help but wonder if the mysterious mycelial connections she'd stumbled upon held the key to reviving the struggling seedlings and ensuring future reforestation success. Unveiling Nature's Cooperation As Suzanne watches her brother Kelly's courageous bull-riding performance, she's reminded of a deep connection with him, much like the symbiosis she later discovers between truffles and trees. This newfound understanding of cooperative relationships in nature challenges her perspective on the modern forestry industry, leading her to question the mystery surrounding her company's dying seedlings. Suzanne took in the sight of her brother Kelly atop a bull, wearing his cowboy hat and leather chaps, ready for the rodeo challenge. As the gate swung open, the raging bull, and Kelly, faced the eight-second test that could bring them prize money. Despite Suzanne's enthusiastic support, Kelly was thrown off the bull at the seventh second, dislocating his shoulder. Despite their initial disappointment, Kelly and Suzanne found comfort in a heartwarming conversation that helped mend their strained bond, reminding them of simpler times before their family fell apart. Even with pain and no prize at stake, their connection brought them closer. Later, as Suzanne headed home, she noticed a squirrel feasting on a truffle found from the ground of a nearby fir tree. This scene piqued her curiosity, so she dug into the soil and discovered that the truffle shared a symbiotic relationship with the tree, as they were bound together by mycelium. The implication was profound, 
the truffle and the tree engaged in a mutually beneficial relationship, with the fur thriving and the fungus bearing fruit. The intricate bond meant that any nutrients or water had to pass through the fungus to reach the tree, inspiring Suzanne to question if this cooperation was essential for their survival. As she sought answers, Suzanne came across the term mycorrhizal fungi in a library book. The mycorrhizal fungus was described as a life-or-death relationship between a plant and a fungus that could not exist without each other. The plant provided the fungus with sugars to grow more mycelium, while the fungus fetched water and nutrients from deeper parts of the soil, delivering them to the plant in exchange. Realizing the importance of cooperation in nature, Suzanne confronted her assumptions about the modern forestry industry, which primarily focused on competitive relationships among forest species. Could these cooperative relationships, like that of mycorrhizal fungi, be the answer to the mystery of her company's dying seedlings? This revelation sparked a renewed desire to understand and embrace the hidden bonds within the natural world. Unraveling the free-to-grow policy Suzanne, a conflicted worker in the logging industry, collaborates with researcher Alan Weiss to investigate the government's free-to-grow policy. The policy involves applying herbicides to clear cuts to promote the growth of conifer seedlings by eliminating competing native plants. Suzanne's experiment compares the effects of varying levels of herbicides on plant survival and growth, ultimately proving that a high dose of poison was effective in killing competing plants but leaving open questions about the seedlings' long-term prospects. As Suzanne and her colleague Ray wrapped pink ribbons around the ancient trees of the clear-cut, she couldn't help but feel a deep pang of guilt. Although it was her job, participating in the destruction of these 500-year-old trees was a painful endeavor. Following a brief layoff, Suzanne's passion for the forest drove her to explore a different path within the industry. Soon, she found herself working with Alan Weiss, a British Columbia Forest Service researcher interested in the effects of weeding practices on high-elevation clearcuts. Eager to gain experience in research, Suzanne helped design an experiment to evaluate the government's free-to-grow policy a practice that aimed to promote conifer seedling growth by wiping out entire native plant populations using herbicides, with Roundup being the most popular choice. This policy framed forests as mere tree farms, ignoring the complex ecosystems they encompass. Suzanne recognized the contradiction of her stance, given her previous work in the logging industry, and her newfound role as a plant executioner in the experiment. However, she believed that understanding the policy's impact on the environment could provide her with the necessary foundation to pursue her true passion, uncovering the mysterious deaths of seedlings in clearcuts. Upon arrival at the designated clearcut site, Suzanne and her sister Robin, who had volunteered to help, observed the thriving native plant life that would soon be targeted by herbicides. Under Alan's guidance, they designed an experiment to test varying herbicide concentrations, specifically, using 1, 3, or 6 liters, on spruce plants. Additionally, they included a manually weeded plot with no herbicides and an untouched control plot for comparison. By repeating each treatment 10 times, they sought to confirm their results conclusively. Ultimately, the results were disheartening. As suspected, the maximum herbicide dose was most effective in killing the competing plants, leaving only the spruce seedlings behind. Although the experiment demonstrated the potency of herbicides and the efficacy of the free-to-grow policy in the short term, Allen reminded Suzanne that their findings did not provide insight into the seedlings' long-term survival or the ecological sustainability of such practices. To unravel this mystery, a more comprehensive experiment was needed, propelling Suzanne further into her quest for understanding. Unraveling Forest's Mysteries Suzanne, a silviculture researcher, found herself facing a conundrum when her experiment to investigate connections between conifer seedlings and fungi kept failing. The seedlings died persistently while surrounding grasses thrived. It occurred to her that seedlings might need specific mycorrhizal fungi to survive. She modified her experiment by adding old-growth forest soil, irradiated soil, and untreated soil, ultimately discovering that the seedlings thrived in the old-growth soil with many fungi. 
Eager to learn more about Forrest's complex relationships, she decided to pursue further education. Suzanne's journey in the world of forestry research began when she secured a job with the Forest Service. This role allowed her to dive into critical questions and experiment with her theories on forests. She soon received a research grant to study the impact of mycorrhizal connections on the survival of conifer seedlings and explore their relationship with native plants. Conducting the experiments proved to be quite challenging, and despite four years of effort and replanting, Suzanne found that the seedlings repeatedly perished. In contrast, the site's lush grasses flourished, which led her to an intriguing realization. While Douglas fir and western larch trees relied on ectomycorrhizal fungi that coat root tips, grasses partnered with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that penetrate root cells. Suzanne speculated that the seedling's survival hinged upon the presence of their specific mycorrhizal fungus. In a new and adjusted experiment, Suzanne tried a different approach. She added live soil from an old-growth forest to one-third of the planting sites, irradiated soil to another third, and left the last third as it was. Upon returning the following year, she noticed a breakthrough. Seedlings in the old-growth soil were thriving, in stark contrast to those in the treated or untouched soils which lay dead. Further investigation revealed myriad colorful fungi entwined with the healthy, surviving seedlings. Elated by the findings, Suzanne recognized the importance of diverse fungi in ensuring tree health and grasped the magnitude of her discovery's implications. With contemporary forestry practices shifting toward monocultures, Suzanne felt compelled to learn more about the complex forest ecosystems and their delicate relationships. To fulfill a pledge she made by an ancient birch tree, she would share her knowledge and advocate for preserving these forest connections to save the trees. With her newfound determination, Suzanne embraced the pursuit of additional education and set her sights on graduate school. The Alder Tree Misconception Contrary to popular beliefs, keeping alder trees doesn't harm pine growth. Suzanne's research found that alders help retain water and provide essential nutrients to pines, meaning that eliminating them is expensive and ineffective. Despite resistance, presenting this vital truth was a necessary step toward better forest management. In front of a packed audience, Suzanne felt the weight of anticipation as she prepared to present her groundbreaking research. The topic at hand was the effects of alder trees on pine growth, a subject that caused a stir within the forestry industry. Her findings challenged conventional wisdom and exposed uncomfortable but essential truths about the role of alders in sustaining healthy forests. For years, the forestry industry viewed alder trees as undesirable weeds that depleted water resources, seemingly depriving pines of valuable sustenance. However, Suzanne's rigorous research painted a much more intricate picture. While alders did withdraw water from the soil, they also released it back through their roots to the surface, ensuring adequate hydration for nearby plants. In contrast, areas without alders experience dry topsoil, causing rainwater to run off and limit water availability. As a result, plots with more alder trees demonstrated increased water retention, making them ultimately beneficial for the growth of pines. The revelation didn't stop with water. Suzanne also uncovered that the decomposed leaves of alder trees release significant amounts of nitrogen, a critical nutrient for pine growth. Removing the alders only provided a temporary supply of nitrogen, while leaving them intact sustained a continuous infusion of this vital element. This compelling evidence shows that eliminating alder trees doesn't result in better pine growth, instead, it costs millions in unnecessary treatments over time. Unsurprisingly, Suzanne's discoveries weren't met with open arms by those who felt threatened by the potential implications. The Forest Service policymakers were hesitant to accept the findings, but it was an essential step forward in addressing forest management practices. To blow off steam after her presentation, Suzanne joined her friends, Kelly and Barb, at a local pub for some drinks. However, when Kelly made a chauvinistic comment comparing cows to women, Suzanne's frustration boiled over. In an impassioned outburst, she made it clear that she wouldn't tolerate such ignorance. As the evening concluded, 
Suzanne's husband Don reassured her that the hard-earned knowledge she brought to light would not go in vain, and things would eventually be fine. Unveiling the Wood Wide Web Suzanne's groundbreaking doctoral research sheds light on the symbiotic relationship between paper birch and Douglas fir trees, dispelling the myth of competition in favor of a collaborative utility of a shared mycorrhizal network. Tragedy strikes her personal life, but the loss amplifies her drive to share her findings, ultimately making an undeniable impact on forestry practices and captivating the world. Suzanne's heart raced as she scrutinized the data on the carbon transfer field report. The results were groundbreaking, and it felt surreal. Her doctoral research focused on the relationship between paper birch and Douglas fir trees, which revealed a dynamic network of cooperation. Contrary to popular belief, the birch tree wasn't competing with the fir but was essential for its survival. The two tree species actively traded carbon via a shared mycorrhizal network. What's more, the birch tree's generous carbon donations proved vital for the fir's reproduction. This revelation showcased communication, collaboration, and cooperation transcending previous conceptions of competition among trees. The trees formed an intelligent, unified system that thrived when interconnected, proving that they needed each other. Tragedy struck when Suzanne received a call from her sister-in-law Tiffany, informing her that Kelly was dead. Overcome with grief, Suzanne struggled to make sense of her loss in the days that followed. The memory of her final words with him, fueled by anger and resentment, haunted her. Filled with sorrow and unable to reconcile with her sibling, Suzanne found solace in her research. Driven by this newfound determination, Suzanne readied her research for publication. Her findings on the carbon-sharing relationship between birch and fir trees, facilitated by fungal networks, caught the attention of the prestigious scientific journal Nature. Initially rejected, it eventually landed on the cover in August 1997 after revision. The story was dubbed the Wood Wide Web, making Suzanne an overnight sensation. The research had proven, for the first time, the significant flow of carbon via fungal networks across different tree species. Suzanne's newfound fame helped secure a position at the University of British Columbia. As she started her new role, she discovered that her research had significantly impacted Canadian forest management policies. Her groundbreaking work led to a reduction in the use of herbicides in forests, decreasing the amount sprayed by 50%. Suzanne's unwavering perseverance and the serendipitous fusion of loss and discovery transformed the understanding and appreciation of the natural world. Mother Trees, Forest Guardians Suzanne discovers a tantalizing connection between trees while away from her family, leading her to ponder the existence of mother trees that guide and protect the younger ones in the forest. With a newfound appreciation for their intricacies, she realizes that she herself plays a similar role in her daughter's lives. Suzanne found herself under the relentless sun, counting down the hours until she would embark on her nine-hour commute from Vancouver back to Nelson, British Columbia. In the meantime, she was unexpectedly stung by a wasp and fled from its swarm up a nearby crest. Upon reaching the top, she rested against a massive old tree, whose branches stretch 25 meters into the sky. Surrounding its northern side, she noticed a cluster of young seedlings. Intrigued, she unearths a seedling and catches sight of thin fungal threads connecting it to the grand tree nearby. The realization that the mature trees were deeply rooted and provided essential resources to shallow-rooted plants in dry summer days stirred something within Suzanne, the old trees were like guardians of the younger ones, as mother trees. Driven by curiosity, she sketched a concept in her notepad with a mother tree in the center, connected to saplings and seedlings through a mycorrhizal fungal network. The pattern strikingly resembled a neural network, sparking an electrifying thought, could the mycorrhizal network function similarly to a human neural network, allowing trees to communicate thoughts and emotions? Fueled by this question, Suzanne scribbled down some numbers and made a fascinating observation. The relative amounts of carbon and nitrogen transferred through mycorrhizal networks were actually akin to the quantities found in glutamate, the most abundant neurotransmitter in the human brain. She wondered, could mycorrhizal networks be about transmitting information, 
and with mother trees as central hubs, were these networks indicative of some form of intelligence. Feeling both grateful and connected to the mother trees for this revelation, Suzanne vowed to publish her insights as soon as she could. When she finally arrived home, she silently greeted her daughters Hannah and Nava with a kiss and a gentle squeeze of the hand. In that moment, she recognized her own role as a mother tree in her daughters' lives, cultivating their growth just as the grand trees nurtured the smaller ones in the forest. Mother Tree's Life Lessons Suzanne, a university professor, was struck by questions surrounding the survival of ponderosa pine trees in the face of adversity. Her observations led to the discovery of a survival mechanism within tree communities. Simultaneously, she grappled with her own struggle with breast cancer, relating to the mother tree's efforts to ensure the survival of their lineage. A decade after beginning her teaching career at the University of British Columbia, Suzanne's personal life had become strained. While navigating a separation during the summer of 2012, she found herself pondering the resilience of ponderosa pine trees, many of which had succumbed to a mountain pine beetle infestation. Intrigued by the few surviving seedlings scattered among the decimated pines, she questioned how these young trees were able to survive with minimal resources. Observing the dynamic interplay between the surviving ponderosas and other trees, she wondered whether a deeper connection existed. Could the dying mother trees be transferring their remaining resources to their offspring? Were the surviving ponderosas learning from their Douglas fir neighbors, adapting to better handle environmental stressors? As Suzanne mulled over these questions, she was also grappling with a new challenge, the discovery of a lump in her breast. Despite a clean bill of health from her last mammogram, her concern continued to grow. Soon, she and her colleague, Yuan Yuan, received data from a year-long experiment revealing an astonishing finding. Stressed fir trees had shared a significant portion of their nutrients and carbon, not only with their own roots and mycorrhizas but also with surrounding ponderosa pines. This mutual sharing had strengthened the tree's defense systems against potential threats. This groundbreaking discovery was bittersweet for Suzanne, who was still waiting for her biopsy results. She couldn't help but draw parallels between herself and the dying mother trees, pondering whether she, too, would have to rely on her last reserves to ensure her children's well-being. As a precaution, she discussed the possibility of cancer with her daughters, emphasizing the importance of screening and early detection. When the dreaded call from the doctor's office came, confirming Suzanne's cancer diagnosis, she faced her own mortality. Like the mother trees, even she couldn't live forever. Yet the tree's relentless fight for survival offered a powerful lesson that resonated with Suzanne. She realized the importance of resilience and adaptability, passing on wisdom and strength not just in terms of biology, but also in the values taught to her children. Healing Powers of Mother Trees Following a double mastectomy, Suzanne begins the next stage of her cancer treatment, chemotherapy infusions, with the first half being a difficult drug known as Red Devil and the second half being Paclitaxel, derived from U-trees. As Suzanne perseveres through her treatment, she takes strength from nature, asking the trees to heal her. Her grad student, Amanda, confirms that mother trees send more carbon to the fungi of their kin, signifying a two-way relationship like those in the forest. Eventually, finding solace in the presence of U-trees with her loved ones, Suzanne finishes her treatments and appreciates the resilient power of trees. Suzanne had hoped that her battle with cancer would end after a double mastectomy, but her ordeal continued as the disease spread to her lymph nodes. Now facing eight chemotherapy infusions over four months, she braced herself for the first round of the intense drug known as Red Devil. Her will to stay strong showed when, the day after her first treatment, she skied 20 kilometers and asked the trees for help in healing her during her journey. During this time, Suzanne's grad student, Amanda, was researching how mother trees interacted with both kin and non-kin seedlings. The experiments revealed that not only did mother trees send more carbon to the mycorrhizal fungi that belonged to their kin, but they also grew larger when situated near their offspring. This symbiotic relationship mirrored many of the connections found in the forest, inspiring Suzanne to persevere despite her ordeal. 
The second half of her chemotherapy treatment involved paclitaxel, a medicine derived from yew trees. Despite causing exhaustion, Suzanne found it easier to cope with than the Red Devil. She rediscovered the strength to walk in the forest and even found solace in the company of Mary, her new girlfriend who shared the same love for the forest. Together, they went to find the yew trees, which were responsible for Suzanne's healing medicine. Finally, as her yew treatments concluded, Suzanne brought her daughters Hannah and Nava to the yew grove to meet the mother tree that had provided her with life-saving medicine. They hugged the tree together in a moment of gratitude, as Suzanne silently wished for the trees to watch over her daughters just as they had watched over her. Like the remarkable mother trees in the forest, Suzanne embodied resilience during her grueling journey against cancer. In Finding the Mother Tree, Suzanne Samar posits a compelling argument for cooperation and connection as the key drivers of thriving forest ecosystems. Samar unveils the importance of mycorrhizal fungi and their underground networks, a discovery that has the potential to revolutionize modern forestry practices. Throughout her journey, Samar encounters pushback from traditional forestry, but her persistence leads to invaluable findings. Ultimately, the book serves as a testament to the intricate, cooperative relationships that exist beneath the forest floor and offers profound insights into how we can learn from these ancient connections to cultivate a more sustainable relationship with our environment while realizing the importance of working in harmony with nature, rather than against it.